Hey, Experience Church. I wanna welcome everyone today. Also wanna take a moment and say a special hello to all the men and women in our correctional ministry. We're honored to have you a part of our church. And so come on, Defiance, help me welcome our church family today. Well, Pastor Justine and I have the privilege of leading a mission trip to the country of Belize. And so we're leading a vacation Bible school for kids. We're meeting with different churches and leaders as we get ready for our third annual serve day in the country of Belize. And we're meeting with pastors Audley and Kimberly and their launch team as we continue to make preparations to launch an experienced church campus in Belize. And so there's a lot of amazing things that God is doing in the country of Belize. But while we're gone, I'm excited to have one of my good friends, Pastor Chad Fisher, in the house. Pastor Chad and his wife Katie planted Rock City Church 12 years ago in Columbus, Ohio. And God is doing some incredible things in and through their church. Thousands of people attend one of their four locations every week throughout the Columbus area. They've partnered with 30 different prisons throughout Ohio. They have a dream center who's coming alongside those in need to give them a hand up, not just a handout. And they are truly a church that goes beyond its walls. Justine and I are so grateful to have Chad and his wife, Katie, in our lives. And I'm honored to have him in the house today. And so do me a favor and let's stand to our feet and let's give an experienced church welcome to Pastor Chad Fisher. Thank you, thank you. Before you see it, can we make some noise for Jesus? Come on, can we give honor where honor is due? Come on, can we celebrate Jesus in the house? He deserves all honor, glory, and praise. You can go ahead and have a seat. It is an absolute honor uh, to be here with you. I, I was uh, just so uh, grateful to receive the invitation from Pastor Kyle. He and Justina and their family are uh, some of our very best friends in all the world. Our families just really love each other. And I, I'm so uh, inspired by what God is doing in this church. I got the chance to preach at the first service and, and just experiencing worship here for the second time. Last time I was here was the grand opening of this space and just to see what God has done. Can, can we make some noise one more time for Jesus? And, and can we honor your pastors and the leadership team here? What an incredible team from the parking lot to the platform. Just everybody is doing such a great job. There's just really one thing that I don't understand about this church. And, um, and that is, why is it that when I go on a mission trip, it's to Afghanistan. <laughs> but when you go on a missions trip, it's to Belize. Please. All I'm saying is I, I googled what does it look like in Belize? And this is what I saw. Now, apparently, sea turtles need Jesus too. And you know I'm kidding, right? Y'all are doing incredible work in Belize. I, I am working on my resume, though I'm almost finished. I plan on having it turned in before I leave. I want to be that campus pastor. Uh, I, will, I will just, I am experienced church. I am experienced church. Belize. One missions trip I went on, no, no joke, this is a true story. I stayed, it wasn't in Belize. I won't tell you where, I can't really tell you where. Um, it was a very hostile uh, part of the world. And uh, the hotel that I stayed in, the entire front of the, of the building was caved in, completely collapsed. It was like a, a bomb went off and probably one actually did. And the, neither were the sides like, like standing up. It only really now that I think about it, it had a roof and a back wall and really nothing else. And we, the, the, the bathroom that I had in my room, it was a hole in the ground with a piece of wood on top. And, and you would just lift up the wood and prop it up against the wall. When you look down into that hole, I'm not lying to you. There were live pigs running around picking up what we put down. If y'all follow my drift, it was the most insane the most insane experience. One of the first times I got to know uh, your pastor was actually on 
a mission trip to Central America and uh, our church in, in Columbus. We've been now partnered with Central America for like 12 years now, but it was the first time that I really got to know Pastor Kyle and uh, not, not just to hear your pastor's story. And if you don't know Pastor Kyle's story, you need to just ask somebody. It's, it's just one of those incredible stories that reminds all of us that, that God does not give up on anybody. Can I get an amen? God does not give up on anybody. He will use anyone and nobody's too far gone. If you're watching right now from a prison cell, hey, that's where this pastor got met by Jesus. And I just want you to know God is not giving up on you. He does not give up on anybody. And I got to hear Kyle's story, Pastor Kyle, and uh, got to really know his heart. And that's when my family and I really began connecting with the brown leaves. And I just hope you you know this. I, I, I see it from afar, but y'all get to experience this every single week. I hope that every time you, you drive into this parking lot, you walk through one of these doors. I hope you say thank you, Jesus. I, just, I hope you never take for granted what God is doing here. And, and I, hope, I hope you know that we uh, at Rock City Church in Columbus, Ohio, we are praying for you. We are cheering you on. We are proud uh, about what God is doing here. And uh, the Lord's hand is on this house. Do you believe that? Aren't you glad to be a part of a life-giving, spirit-filled house that, that God's hand is on and he's blessing and he's growing this church and y'all are making such an incredible difference. And I, I'm reminded, and anytime I think about uh, what God is doing here or what God is doing back home in Columbus, I, I just have to say thank you, Jesus, because though we get to partner with him and we get to participate in this incredible kingdom work, y'all know Jesus is doing the heavy lifting, Right? That's why the, the word says, now to him be all glory, honor, and praise, right? It's, it's, it's his work. It's his power that is at work within us and, and in his church and through his church in every generation. And so I just want you to join me right now. Could we just uh, pray to the Lord and, and, and give him the honor that is due him? Jesus, we give you honor. All honor belongs to you. We give you praise. Even though it's not adequate praise, we, we give you Glory and honor and praise. We thank you for your presence here. I thank you for what you're doing in this church. Pray, I pray you're covering over the Brownleys and the team and Belize and the continued work as they're working toward launching a campus there and the, uh, all, all the ministry that's happening right now. I pray for every family in this place and those watching from a distance right now that, uh, that your Holy Spirit would give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word in a fresh new way today. And that through your word and by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that we would be changed, challenged, transformed to look just a little bit more like Jesus when we leave than when we came. And it is in Jesus' mighty, holy, perfect, matchless, and powerful name we pray. Everybody said, amen. I brought a picture of my, my family. Um, they all couldn't be here. My, my oldest daughter, Morgan, is there all the way on the left. She's 16, takes her driver's test in two days. She'll be driving me back to Columbus this afternoon. So pray for me and pray for her. Uh, they took out an extra uh, key man insurance on me right before they knew she was going to be driving me around. So uh, just trying to make sure our church stays strong. And then my other daughter, um, Macy, she's almost 14. She'll be 14 in September. She's right to uh, my right. And then that's my wife, Katie, on the end. A few people after service says, said we couldn't quite tell who was your wife and who was your daughter. And um, so I made sure to text that to my wife. My daughters didn't really like that so much, but my wife, I'm sure she's she's grateful. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 4 and Luke chapter 10. We're going to be spending most of our time in Luke chapter 10, looking to the story of the Good Samaritan. But we're going to go first to Luke chapter 4. The title for today's message is The Man in the Dirt. So if you want to write that down, The Man in the Dirt. Now, before we dive into the story of the Good Samaritan, which I would submit to you is probably the most well-known of all of Jesus' stories, you, you will be hard-pressed to find anybody anywhere who is not at least a tad bit familiar with the Good Samaritan story, I would humbly submit to you that, that most people, perhaps even most people in this room right now, or at least maybe now, or, or when you first heard the story or the first several times you heard the story, that, that most of us tend to miss what is the main part of Jesus' story or, or the main point. 
that we hear the story of the Good Samaritan, but we kind of, it's easy to miss the forest for the trees. And so I want to spend the next few moments, unpack this story with you and for you. But before we do, Luke chapter four, what Jesus does in Luke chapter four is he gives us really what is his personal mission statement. For the first time, he stands out in a, in a, stands up in a synagogue and he publicly declares the reason he's come, the why behind the what he does and everything that he preaches. And he says this, that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Can we say just that first part together? Say it out loud. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Say it one more time. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, it's important that we recognize the same Holy Spirit power that empowered Jesus is the Holy Spirit power that not only empowers the church today, but that same Holy Spirit birthed the church in Acts chapter 2. Can I get an amen? If you're full of the Holy Spirit, if you're grateful for the Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit power that worked in and through Jesus when he walked the earth among us is the same Holy Spirit power that is still at work and active in the world today through the church. Jesus stands up for the first time and he says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and I have been anointed, which means I've been set apart to proclaim good news to the poor. I've been appointed I've been empowered by the Spirit to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And of course, he's talking about the, the physically blind and bound and the, and the spiritually blind and bound, the, the, the physically poor, the, the spiritually poor, because this is a holistic gospel that, that addresses both physical and spiritual needs. Amen? It's why in, in, in Mark chapter 16, when, when Jesus is commissioning his church to go and do what we've seen him do, he says, therefore, go into all the world and preach the gospel. You've heard me preach, declare the word that I have declared to all creation. Why? Because whoever hears and believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. How many of you know that's a really good reason for the church to be about the work of Jesus in our world today? People need Jesus but I love how he goes on in the next verse by saying, and these will be the signs of those who believe that in my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. I'm mean, never, you know, if, if you're demon possessed and that demon gets cast out or you're, you're sick, in your body and suddenly you're healed. That, that has both spiritual implications, but, but dramatic physical implications as well. Social implications as well. Relational implications as well. And I love how Jesus in Mark 16, what he's saying to the church is that we are invited into and as we are invited to engage in the Great Commission, which is what we call in our church the only mission that matters, making heaven full. That while we're busy engaging with Jesus, empowered by the Spirit, making heaven full, what Jesus is saying is, how about you go ahead and make some people well in the process while you're at it? While you're declaring a gospel that saves the soul, when you see somebody who's hungry, how about you give him a piece of bread, a sandwich? While you're declaring the bread of life, while you're declaring salvation to those who are spiritually impoverished and enslaved, how about you pay attention to the man in the dirt? How about you pay attention to the person that is hurting and helpless and hopeless and desperate and they just need a, a smile, they, they, they need a hand, they, they need a, a word, they, 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 they need some sort of recognition from the church. It's a great reminder to the church that 
the purpose that we've been called to by God. It is the same purpose for which Jesus came. And that is to step into the dirt of a broken, hopeless, hurting, desperate, dying world and to declare a gospel that saves and heals and transforms and delivers and sets free. Amen. That we are to be about the work that Jesus was all about. And my question that I've asked my church and I want to ask this church as well is if the work that began with Jesus is meant to continue in and through his church has the work that began with Jesus continued through all of his church or has the work that began with Jesus stalled or perhaps even stopped with some of us. When when I read about how the church begins full of the Holy Spirit commissioned by Jesus to go, just like Jesus went, to, to serve like Jesus served, to love like Jesus loves. When I think about a God who so loved the world that he would give his one and only son, who was willing not just to step into the dirt, but to clothe himself with it, to be buried, that the seed of salvation be sown, to be raised up out of the dirt that we might be raised from death to life. As I think about a God who, who's, who's not unwilling to get his hands dirty, aren't you glad we, we serve a God who, who's willing to touch the untouchable, to, to welcome to his side those that the world rejects? And the question is, has the work that began with Jesus continued through all the church or has the work stopped or stalled with maybe you? I'm reminded of a video that went viral back in 2011. That was the year that we launched our church. It was of a young Chinese girl, just two years old. She had wandered away from her mother in a, in a busy Chinese market, ventured into the road and What was captured by security camera footage is this little girl being run over by a pretty large truck. And it wasn't that nobody seemed to notice. Actually, there were quite a few who noticed. And what you can see on this video is seven minutes passing by while not one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine or even 10. But as as 17 passers by, Look upon this girl in need and continue on their way until after the seven minute mark, she's run over for a second time. Still alive, finally a woman sees her and picks her up and brings her to safety. She's reunited with her mother and she lives for another week before succumbing to her injuries. She's been called the girl who shamed China and for good reason. Why did nobody stop and help this girl in need? Well, apparently, as it's been explained, as there was legislation in China at the time that that for a person to stop and help another in need, you would be automatically assuming responsibility to care for that person for the long haul or for whatever their injuries were in that, that moment. And apparently... For those 17 passers by, nobody seemed to think that little girl lying there all alone and in desperate need was worth the added responsibility. And so they continued on their way. Now there was obviously global outrage. And what's interesting to me is about two years passed from that incident. It was around the year 20. 13 and and this nation that is doing everything it can to silence the church and to stomp out the Christian voice in that nation actually established legislation based upon Jesus teaching. They called it the Good Samaritan legislation. And that Good Samaritan legislation would absolve a person from taking upon themselves all of the personal responsibility of care should they stop to help a person in need. Obviously, if you've seen this video or just hearing it, your heart will break. My heart broke the moment I I saw what was happening there. But I I have to wonder beyond, beyond that how the heart of our Father in heaven must break. As he looks upon our cities where he's planted us on purpose, as he looks upon our neighborhoods where we live, our workplaces where we show up every single day, as as he looks upon our classrooms and 
playing fields and, and see so many people who aren't just hurting physically and emotionally, but who are dying spiritually and living apart from him and, and who will one day die apart from him because so many of us who know him have been slow, indifferent, or unwilling to share him or to show him. I think about the people we pass by on the street that we work with every day, that we go to school with every single week who do not know Jesus still because we're silent. I think about this world as we see our culture continue to spiral deeper and deeper into confusion. Will, will, will the church remain silent, unwilling, afraid to speak truth to culture? As poverty claims life after life, as injustice continues to reign, will the church stand by as if with blinders on, like we see nothing at all, or, or as if we believe that government was God's design to save people? When it's not the government's design to save anybody, come on, Jesus is the one who saves, and it's the reason he's planted his church in Defiance, Ohio. He's the hope of the world and we're called to bring that light, to be that salt. On one occasion in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Not a great way to start your day with Jesus when the first thing you want to do is test Jesus. But he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now clearly he's not asking this question out of real genuine desire. He's seeking to test the Lord. This is a flawed question. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. Ephesians 2 says, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast, right? This is a flawed question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? But Jesus responds to the question with a question. He says to the religious expert, what is written in the law? How do you read the law? The expert answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus replied, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. And so he asks a follow-up question, who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus tells the story. A man was going down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho. He was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road, and when he came to the place and he saw him, and he passed him by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds, pouring out oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, look after this man. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense that you may have. Jesus asked the expert, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Then Jesus ends his conversation with this religious expert in the law with four words that stand among the greatest moral teachings of all times by, by, by saying, go and do likewise. Go and do like this. Now, now there's a point to the Good Samaritan story, of course there is a point. Jesus would not have told the story of not to make a point. But I want us to remember that there were two questions asked of Jesus that day. Question number one. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And that was a test. He was trying to trap 
Jesus. And what we need to understand right now is that what Jesus is not saying is that if you want to be saved, what it really boils down to is how much good you do for others. That's not, that's not the point of the story. I'm not walking around trying to build up my good work so that when I get to heaven, God can look at me and say, I think this boy's done good enough. Come on in. Welcome home. Jesus said, nobody is good except for God alone. Amen. That's not the point of the story. At least it's not all the point. What Jesus does though, is he, because he's Jesus and his wisdom is beyond this world, beyond our own earthly wisdom, he actually does answer both questions quite brilliantly, but the story is in direct response to the second question. Who then is my neighbor? I want us to think about that second question as it relates to the story of the Good Samaritan. This question has always come to mind when, when Jesus tells the story, a priest just happened to be passing by. Do, do you think that a, a priest just really happen to be passing along a road where there just happened to be a man who was beaten and in need? Or, or do you think that perhaps by God's divine and sovereign wisdom and plan and purpose that, that, that knowing there would be a man in desperate need, he, he sort of sent this priest along who thinks that he's just happening by, but the Lord in his sovereignty knows he's about to pass by a need and there's an opportunity for a miracle to take place. I think about Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, that says we are really good at making plans for ourselves, but the Lord determines our steps. Do you think Pastor Kyle and Justina just happened to stumble upon the city of defiance, Ohio? Or do you believe that God in his sovereignty just might have it in his heart to do an incredible and miraculous work in this city? And that today, the seed of salvation and the seed of revival is being sown because they said yes to the call of God, to the plan of God, and stepped into his mercy. Do you think that you just happen to be here today or that God has something in store for you today? I hear so many people bemoaning this generation. Look at our generation. It's all going to hell in a handbasket. What are we supposed to do? I don't know, but we better do something. And if you don't know what to do, get on your knees and pray and fast for this generation. All I know is, is that the Lord could have looked upon all of human history, every point in time for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And he could have had us all be born in the dark ages. How'd you like that? We could all been pilgrims. How, how would you have loved that? I wouldn't have wanted to be a pilgrim. I'm glad to be born in this generation alive. In this generation, the Lord in his wisdom saw to it that we, that this generation would be stewarded by us, that this church would be a steward of this generation. So before we bemoan this generation, how about we get on our knees and cry out to the Lord for this generation and get to work reaching this generation and serving this generation and empowering and engaging this generation with the gospel. I've learned to never discount the place that I'm in. Because wherever I am, it's to be used by God. Sometimes I think we try so hard to, to, we're always wanting to get to the next place. But what does God have in store for you and in mind for you to accomplish in the place that you are? I think it's interesting too that Jesus, he doesn't first call out the, the non-religious. He calls out the religious, those like the priest and the Levite who say, I love the Lord. When Jesus is saying, if you love the Lord, you're going to love what the Lord loves. You're going to love who the Lord loves. You're going to do what the Lord does. You're going to serve the Lord with heart, mind, soul, and strength. Why? Because Galatians 5 says this, that, that the only thing that counts, it's, it's not just faith alone. It is faith that expresses itself through love. 
This is how we know what love is. First John chapter three, that Christ Jesus laid down his life for us. That he would step into the dirt and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? This isn't Pastor Chad commentary, by the way. This is the word of God. And it is a convicting word, but it's the life that we've been called to. Not a life of word and of speech faith only, but a life that is filled with love, that, that is full of action and truth. Faith without works isn't faith. It's dead love without effort and action. It's not love, it's emptiness. So I love how Jesus, he, he's saying to this expert in the law, if you really love God, you'll love who God loves. You'll love what God loves. Your heart will break for what breaks the heart of God. You, you, you'll do what the Lord is doing. Let's not miss the point of the story. I, I, I want to say it this way. We don't go and do to be saved. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? Sometimes I think we try to, well, if I can just give my tithe and offering, it's what's going to get me to heaven. If I can just make sure I keep serving and don't miss a day, then, then I, I, I'm storing up an account in heaven that, that the, the Lord is not going to be able to deny me. Now we're saved not by works. By faith, through the grace of Jesus, we're, 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 we don't go and do to be saved. We, we, we go and we do and we serve and we, we toil because we are saved. We don't go and do to, to, to earn the approval of the Lord. We, we go and do and serve because we have the approval of the Lord. We don't go and do and give, and we're not generous because we want God to love us more. We've been loved by God with an unfathomable, unconditionable love, and we want the world to know the love that we've received. We want the world to experience the love that we have experienced in Jesus Here's the part of the story that I think people tend to miss. And it's probably our context. It's probably because we're, most of us are Americans. If you're watching from, from a, a country outside of America, maybe, maybe you get this passage more than some of us get this passage. Most of us are probably not Jewish. None of us grew up in first century Palestine. And so there tends to be a little bit of a disconnect when Jesus tells the story and he asks the expert in the law, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Context matters a lot when it comes to so much of what we read in the New Testament and in the context of this moment is that this Jewish expert in the law, he couldn't stand Samaritans. There was nothing to a Jewish person more despicable than a Samaritan. I imagine when the expert answers Jesus, he's, he's answering through gritted teeth. Can't even stomach the thought of a Samaritan being good at all. Can't even get himself to, to say the word. I, I can't even use the word. And so to answer your question, Lord, I'm just going to say the one, the one. Jesus, he knows that this man will not want to identify with the Samaritan. He's going to have a hard time recognizing that a, any Samaritan could be a good Samaritan. See, the disconnect is when we hear the story, the first person we want to identify with is a Samaritan because we don't know any Samaritans. We don't have any prejudice against Samaritans. Sign me up. Pastor Chad, the good Samaritan. I'll take it. I love it. Isn't that the whole point of the story? It's part the point. It's not the main point. Jesus knows this man's not going to identify with the Samaritan. And Jesus knows he's not going to want to identify with the robbers. He's not going to want to identify with the priest who clearly was not the hero in this story. And he's not going to want to identify with the Levite. He's not the hero in this story either. So I wonder who's left. I wonder who's left in this story for this religious expert in the law to identify with. I can think of one. 
the only man left, the man in the dirt. <laughs> the man in the dirt is the only one left. And I, I love how Jesus is actually answering in an indirect way the very first question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? By saying this, that before ever any of us can ever learn to begin to identify with the Good Samaritan, who is clearly Jesus in the story, not us. That's the American way of reading the Bible. Jesus is the Good Samaritan. And he's saying before any of us could ever begin to identify with the Good Samaritan, the hero in the story, we must first learn to identify with the man in the dirt. Do you want to be saved? You're the man in the dirt. You can't help yourself. You can't fix yourself. You can't lift yourself up and out the pit that you've dug for yourself. You can't put yourself on a donkey, take yourself to an end until we can see that we are just as beat up and broke down as the man in the dirt, that we are as helpless and as hopeless apart from the help and the hope that comes by way of Jesus, the only one with power to save, the only name given to mankind under heaven by which we must be saved. We're not getting away from our sin. We're not lifting ourselves up out the ditch that we've dug for ourselves. We're not finding wholeness and healing and freedom. Only by Jesus can we be saved and and healed and transformed and set free and delivered and sanctified and justified. This is the gospel that we, I used to, the first time I preached this message, I said, this is the gospel that I'm compelled to preach. No, we are compelled to preach this gospel. Romans 3, 23, we've all sinned and we've all fallen short as you say amen Romans 6 23 the wage of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord Romans 10 13 everyone no matter who you are or where you've been, if you're in a prison cell today, no matter how far you've run from God, no matter how much sin you've got tallied up on your account, everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved. He counts nobody out. He counts nobody out. Everyone. Very next verse says this, but how then can they call? on the one that they've not believed in and how can they believe in the one that they've not heard of and how can they hear without someone preaching to them and how can anyone preach to them unless they're sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news Amada should have entitled this message do you have beautiful feet <laughs> it would have taken a long time to get to the main point do you have beautiful feet are your feet beautiful to the people around you that God has purposefully placed within your sphere of influence? Because you're sharing Jesus, showing Jesus, modeling Jesus. We're going to pray together and I just want you to consider perhaps what side of this story might you be on? What, what side? Are you on the side of, a, of the saved and sent because you were saved to be sent. You were saved and now because you're saved, you're commissioned by Christ and empowered by the Spirit of God to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the earth. Are you on the side of the saved and the sent, but you've been living with perhaps indifference toward the lost, the hurting, those who don't know Jesus yet, those who need a, a healing touch? Have you been saved and sent, but but you've been living just, just maybe not so much engaged in the mission of the church. And it might be time to join a small group. It might be time to start serving on the weekend. It might be time to maybe bring somebody with you next week that you know could use an encouragement, a word from the Lord, an encounter with Jesus. Are you on the side of the saved and the sent, but, but you've been living without real 
purpose and and it's time for you to begin to see the world the way Jesus sees the world and to love the lost the way Jesus loves the lost. Are you on the side of the man in the dirt? Like we've all been, we're all that man, but by the grace of God and perhaps for the first time, you're, you're hearing a perhaps familiar story, but, but you're realizing, you know what, before I relate with the Samaritan, that's good. I need to recognize that there's sin in my life. And I need Jesus to forgive me of my sin. I, I need to be saved. I want to be saved. I can't fix myself, forgive myself, save myself, but Jesus can. And perhaps you're on the side of the man in the dirt and you would say today, I'm going to call upon the name of Jesus today. I'm going to reach out to the Lord and ask him to forgive me of my sin. And today my life will be forever changed. If that's you, Or if you're on the other side, would you bow your head and close your eyes with me, everybody? To the saved and the sent, may we ask the Lord together, renew in our heart a passion for the lost, renew in our spirit a desire to see your kingdom work unfold in us and through us and all around us. Use us, God. May we be vessels that you use. May we be tools in your hand. Not indifferent, not apathetic, not lazy, not ignorant as to what we've been called to do. Would you renew in us a passion for those who need you and use us to reach them and to minister to them in Jesus' name and to those who are here and you'd say, I need Jesus. I want to be saved and forgiven of my sin. Just ask him, say, Lord, I'm here and I need you. You who died for me were raised from death to life for me. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from the inside out. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and lead me daily by your presence into the purpose that you created me to live. That I would live my life for you. That I would make a difference. That I would make heaven full. Because you're going to use me to lead others into relationship with you. Just like I'm being led into relationship with you right now. Use me, Lord. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Come on, church. Everybody said, amen.